Call the meeting to order and welcome everyone here this evening. Uh, the beautiful day, I was sad that we have to end it inside. Uh, but, but anyway, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance, so I'll ask Zantavius Hinton if you come forward and lead us in the pledge. item would be the approval of the agenda. I'll make a motion we approve the agenda. Second. second. Motion made. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And motion carries. Thank you. Each uh, month at our regular, hello, <laughs> each month at our regular meeting, uh, we recognize uh, a student and teacher from one of the public schools in Zebulon. And uh, this month it's uh, Zebulon Elementary Schools. And Tavis, you want to come join me? <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Zantavius Hinton is the student. So I'll read what uh, uh, the principal wrote about him. I assume it was written by the principal, but anyways, and Tavius Hinton is great role model for those around him. He is a supportive friend who is always demonstrating pride behavior throughout the school. Centavius is a leader in all of his classrooms by always putting forth his best effort and encouraging and helping his peers. Dantavis is also a part of our very first PEPI, Physical Education Pupil Instructor, elective at Zebulon Elementary School, where he worked with our part day special needs preschool class, teaching them games and helping them develop their socialization and motor skills. Thank you for setting the standard for excellence for your peers to replicate. And I will present this to you. Thank you. Uh, the teacher is Krista Shirley. Krista here? Ah, good. Hey. The Zebulon GT Magnet Elementary community proudly nominates Krista Shirley as our spotlight teacher for February 2020. Ms. Shirley serves as the health and physical education teacher at Zebulon Elementary, but she does so much more than teach PE. Ms. Shirley is a natural leader who knows how to vision and set, uh, vision set and rally others around a common goal. She is a vital leader on our school improvement team. She helps lead our PBIS committee. And you'll have to tell me what that is. Positive Behavior Intervention and Support. Positive Behavior Intervention and Support. Thank you. <laughs> she is responsible for revamping our mag magnet program through implementing new and engaging electives and she is part of the leadership on our school's social committee. Ms. Shirley exemplifies being the change you want to see. She never complains, but she consistently works to improve our school and learning outcomes. Congratulations, and thank you for being your best, Ms. Shirley. And I have this for you. That for me is the best part of the evening. I always enjoy doing that. Uh, and I appreciate the effort that those people put forward. Uh, each uh, regular meeting, first meeting of the month, uh, we allow public comment. So uh, we have two speakers that want to uh, make comments this evening. They each have three minutes. 
And so I'll start with Mary Beth Carpenter. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Mary Beth Carpenter, Executive Director of Preservation Zebulon. I'm here before you tonight to thank you for allowing us to use Wakelon for our Preservation Day celebration, which is going to be held this Saturday, February 8th, from 1 to 4 p.m. It's open to the public. It's free. Donations, of course, are accepted. We will be taking old photos and scanning them. And also, we'll be doing video segments where we're doing 10-minute segments of Memories of Zebulon and capturing them on film. We're trying to build up a large archive of these. We've done 14 so far, hour-long segments, and now we're trying to do 10-minute segments. But we thank you for the use of the facility and for our nonprofit grant that you gave us last year, which is underwriting the funding of this. We're also going to be showing Rex Tippett's Farming Heritage film that's about 24 minutes long that we showed at our annual meeting. We're gonna have it showing, and we're also doing a slideshow of some photos that are a mixture of um, Edith Tippett's collection and things that people have given us and things that we found in our research. Um, so even if you don't have a photo to share or a memory to share, we will have quite a few displays and we'd love to see you there. And I just wanted to thank you again for your funding and for allowing us to use the facility. We look forward to partnering with the town again in the future. Thank you. Denise Nell. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the board. Um, just a couple of quick updates for you. Um, you guys have seen, I'm sure, the Smithfield Chicken and Barbecue. The facility's coming up um, quickly, and um, I think there were some um, interesting comments on Facebook about what happened to it initially, but that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's great to see that um, coming up. Um, Glenn Lewis's new facility, if you've not been in it, he would love to show it off. Um, they've actually moved in. Um, they expanded um, from leasing a 1600 square foot facility to purchasing the property doing the construction and then putting in a 3,000 square foot facility so in terms of in economic impact they are growing from five full-time employees to nine and um, the capital investment was somewhere between seven and eight hundred thousand um, recognition recently um, in the Triangle Business Journal for our, our Sydney, Sydney Creek uh, residential development. So it's good to see that um, Zebulon is more and more in the forefront of people's minds, especially in the business community. Um, a couple of dates just to mention. The annual meeting and Citizen of the Year recognition will be on Tuesday, March 17, which this year falls on St. Patty's Day. Um, there's more details to come and there's some information on our website. I do have copies of the Citizen of the Year nomination form. That is open for the public as well. And I've got forms with us tonight. They're also on the, available on the website. The deadline for that is Friday. And then this Thursday is Business After Hours. And one of our businesses that actually um, got launched last year, um, Cricket Wireless, they're having their anniversary and they will would love to invite you to the event on Thursday from 5.30 to 7. Thank you. I want to tell you a quick funny story about Smithfield. I don't normally do this, but I was in a, uh, a store and the people were behind the counter were talking about what's going on with Smithfield? Are they going to rebuild or so-and-so? I said, yeah, they're tearing it down, they're gonna rebuild it. Well, so-and-so and so, like, they didn't believe me, you know. So I finally said, well, if I get the mayor to come in here and tell you, will you believe it? And uh, they said, yeah. So I, I gave him a card and walked out. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of interesting stories going on. <laughs> anyway, sometimes you have to have fun. Good. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. All right, uh, next we have the consent agenda. I make a motion we approve the consent agenda. Second. <coughs> Made and second. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. We have a presentation on the 2020 census and update. So I'm going to call on Teresa Piner to introduce our guest.
Mr. Mayor, members of the board, we're excited this evening to have Mr. Ken Wilkins. He is a partnership specialist with the 2020 Census. He is here with us this evening. Um, and a lot of people have been hearing a lot about the census for the last year, and we have been involved in the Zebulon community now since last summer. Uh, address canvassing started back in the summer of 2019, comparing the addresses on the ground from 2010 to what's actually there today. In addition, as much as you have grown and the houses that you've seen come into the area, the new addresses, all of that had to be uh, recorded. Information was pulled from the planning department. And um, so that's continued. In addition, recruiting, partnership, field operations has been on the ground at your holiday events. Uh, been out here uh, and uh, your, your citizens have been very welcoming. They've applied for the positions that were needed. Hundreds uh, were needed in this immediate area, and they have come and met that need. Um, we are still looking to hire people in the area, and Ken will talk a little bit more about that. But in Wake County, you're talking about $19 an hour, working as little as 20 hours a week, um, 58 cent a mile. So um, it is very good money, although it is a temporary position. So at this time, I would like to welcome Mr. Wilkins with us. Again, he's a partnership specialist. We're going to ask him and see if we can come up with some ideas of how we can do a major kickoff uh, closer to April 1st, as well as possibly partner with your Parks and Rec Department with their master plan events that they have coming up and how we can team all these together. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission. Happy to be with you tonight. Uh, before I start, let me just take a, a second, a moment of personal privilege. I served as Wake County Register of Deeds for almost 15 years. My chief deputy was a gentleman by the name of Charles Pulley, who was from this community. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a lot of affection for Charles. He was my solid right-hand man. Just a really good person all over, smart guy. And I would always tell people that when he spoke, he spoke for me. And so I just want to acknowledge him uh, publicly because he was a great gentleman and I, I miss him a lot. So we were very close, worked very well together. And I just wanted to say that publicly. And I would uh, say sorry, amen. Get a little teary eyed. I would agree with you. I would yeah. agree with you. I'm here for the, uh, to talk to you about the 2020 census. Let me also thank Lisa Marklin, certainly Teresa and Joe Moore for their assistance in getting me here. As you can see from the first slide, forming 2020 Census Complete Count Committees, I'm going to tell you what those are in a few minutes. But I use that slide uh, just to show you what's happening in the Atlanta region. We are all a part of the Atlanta region, as you can see, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, our state, and then South Carolina. So we make up what is called the Atlanta region. OK, next slide, please. Do I have it here? Oh, I've got it right here. OK, uh, let's see. Uh, I got you. OK. So our goal is um, to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. The right place is where you spend the majority of your time. The census is about just counting boots on the ground. Anyone in our, in our country or on the soil of our territories gets counted. We want to make sure we count everyone. It doesn't matter what age. And so that's our motto, to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. The Centennial Census, as you probably know, is every 10 years, so we're coming up on one this year. Uh, the first one, as you can see, was conducted in 1790. Uh, the U.S. Marshals used to go around on horseback trying to um, uh, count the number of people, and you see what the numbers were back then. Incidentally, they still ride on horseback out west, um, so that hasn't changed much, but you can get around any way you can in order to count folks. So there are some of my colleagues out there on bicycles. Uh, getting the exercise and making sure they're getting a good count as well. Well, actually, we, they were uh, uh, canvassing addresses, but next year, or later on this year, they'll be going out to help count as well. <laughs> when you look at the census, it's basically about two things, power and money. The power part, I know you all understand, and the money part, I know you understand, but for those who are not totally clear about that, um, the census is basically used to draw the congressional lines and the lines for other races as well. Now, we have uh, 13 congressmen and women, and um, they're not making any more. And so in order for us to have a really good count, which we'd like to do, one state's going to have to lose a, lose a seat, and we're going to have to gain a seat. Our predictions are that with a really good census count, we can pick up one congressional seat. With a great census count, we can possibly pick up two. The economic impact, 
Every time I see that number, I'm just, it just boggles my mind. $675 billion will be distributed among the states every year for 10 years starting in 2021. We need to make sure that North Carolina, the town of Zebulon, the state of North Carolina as well, gets, the, gets their fair share. Uh, you can't see the map, but that's the way the congressional seats are currently apportioned. Uh, and again, we only have, we have 13 and hopefully trying to get to 14 or 15. You can see the participation rates in 2000. In Wake County, it was 76%. In uh, 2010, it was 78. The governor would like us to get to at least 82%. So we've got a little work to do, but we're going in the right direction. So we have what we call our target populations. Um, children five years and under. And let me just talk about that for a minute. In 2010, we missed a million children nationwide for any number of reasons. In your packet, you have a brochure on counting children, which explains some of the reasons why. But one of the main reasons we think is that when the enumerator, commonly what we think of as a census taker came by, or when someone returned the questionnaire, uh, they may have thought that that child under five didn't need to be counted. April 1 is census day, and uh, everyone, no matter how old or how young, should be counted to make sure we get a good count uh, and an accurate count. Our veterans are another group of our target or hard to count populations. Persons with disabilities, persons experiencing homelessness. You may or may not know that, um, I believe it was last Thursday, we had the annual point in time count that counts the homeless and shelters and, and other areas as well. And we'll have a special team going out as we get into April 1 that will count those folks experiencing homelessness who live in other areas who may be in the woods or under a bridge or not in a shelter. Uh, there's a, spe a special effort that's being organized now to capture that population. People living in rural America, we, we have a hard time counting them as well. Our low income and underserved citizens, our senior citizens as well. Our migrant farm workers, there are also efforts being uh, put forth to target and count those who work uh, as migrant farm workers around the state. Our farm-born uh, immigrants, persons with limited English proficiency, and our renters. And so those are our targets, and I'll tell you in a minute how, we will, uh, how we're targeting them uh, in terms of we want to count everyone, but we have special emphasis on these populations because we consider them hard to count. And that'll all tie back into the complete count committees I mentioned in the beginning. So these are some of the uses for census data. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in your packet, you have a, a sheet called 50 ways that census data is used. I would guarantee if you look at that sheet, you'll find something on there you didn't know the census data was used for. And of course, anyone who's writing grants these days, you're using census data. So again, it, it, it's upon us to have a really good count to make sure we've got accurate data for those who are writing grants to help the community out. Future transportation needs, education, healthcare, tra uh, transportation again, social services, emergency response. Where's the next fire station gonna be located? All that's based on census data as well. Now we're really, really pushing the confidentiality piece. <coughs> Let's be honest, we know that there are certain communities where people do not feel com uh, confident responding to the government. And so what we have to tell them is that um, the information is totally confidential. It cannot be shared. I take an oath so that I can't disclose anything I see ever, even after I leave the Census Bureau under penalty of a $250,000 fine and five years in jail. Ladies and gentlemen, I used to think I was a fashion plate. I don't anymore, but I know I don't look good in orange. And so I don't plan to violate that statute there at all. But um, we do believe that folks need to understand how confidential the census is. And we're not gonna convince everyone, but we have to try our darn level best to try to get everyone to believe that it is confidential. The information cannot be shared with any other agency. It can also not be used in a court of law. And the information, what the public will see at the end of the census are numbers. Everything else will be quarantined for 72 years. So we will never ask for the full social number. We'll never ask for money or a donation. We'll never ask on behalf of a political party and we'll never request information such as PIN, PIN codes, passwords, or similar access information to your credit bank, credit cards, bank cards, or financial accounts. So if someone is doing that, they're not working for the Census Bureau. 
But we also know that every time there's an initiative that there will be folks who try to scam people out of their money. You probably heard about the latest Social Security scam that's out there now. We're going to have that with the census as well. So please be vigilant. Tell your friendly friends, family, and church members that if anyone is asking for that kind of information, they're not working for the census. New initiatives in 2020. You can reply to your questionnaire uh, on your phone, laptop, desktop. If folks are not comfortable or don't want to use that technology, they can still request a, a, a form over a landline or through the mail. Um, this is the first time we're trying to do that in an effort to uh, be good stewards of the tax, with the taxpayers' money because it is expensive if we have to have folks going door to door, and that certainly will be the last resort. So these new initiatives will try to make it easier for folks who are comfortable with the technology. And for those who aren't, we've got a way for them to reply to the census as well. So that's, again, some of the data that we collect. Um, and uh, our website, if you'd like to do research, if you're interested in growing your business or your organization, we've got a wealth of information on our website to help you grow your business, find new customers, or expand your organization. So please visit our website. There's so much information on there. Um, when it comes to folks who may be housed in a facility, we have a special section called Group Quarters. And as you can see, I'm not going to read the list, but if you look at the list, these folks will either go to the facility or contact the head of the facility and ask them about the number of people who happen to be there. So it's a special section called Group Quarters. And again, that's part of our effort to count everyone. So the Complete Count Committees is an uh, is, is effort that was put forth in 2010. Um, the county, every county has a Complete Count Committee. And some towns or, or cities uh, in, in Wake County, Fuquay, Verena, has formed their own Complete Count Committee. And they're, they're a member of the Wake County Committee. They chose to, uh, to do that. And basically what the Complete Count Committees are, they're committees of the trusted voices within the community. Folks like yourself, I like to call the folks the Pied Pipers. When they come in the room, folks gravitate toward them. Folks will pick up the phone and ask them what they think about a particular issue or candidate. The folks that people trust. And so every time we see a challenge, such as people experiencing homelessness, our veterans, folks with limited English proficiency, we try to address that by bringing a trusted voice onto that community's complete count committee. Because once again, they're trusted in those communities. And so help, hopefully they can help us get an accurate count within those communities. Some of the uh, complete count committees around the state are having a library day where they're going to open up the library and have folks come in and complete their, their census questionnaire. Some other organizations are opening up the offices to do that as well. And so the complete count committees can be any conglomeration of folks. We just need them to be the trusted voices within the segment. There are some that are faith-based. And some of those faith-based uh, complete count committees are taking the church bus into the community with a couple of laptops to help folks fill it out fill out the form. They, again, are the trusted voices within that community. Um, and so Wake County has a number of um, subcommittees as well. Um, if you go on the websites, you'll see it. But they have a very good organization, expanded organization. We started every, uh, in, in 2018, we spoke with every county manager in the state, asked them to get us before the Board of Commissioners. We've spoken to every Board of Commission, uh, Board of Commissioners, and we've asked them to do two things. One, endorse the 2020 census, and two, uh, endorsed the concept of a complete count committee within their county. And so every one of them has, and so they're, all of them are functioning at this point. So that's a little bit about what the structure looks like, just for information. Uh, you get a chairperson um, who, is, who is the head, and then they begin to appoint other folks in the community who are chairs of various subcommittees as well. And so, again, a little bit about the subcommittee chairs and what they do. And um, this is a, an example of the structure of most of the complete count committees. There's no set uh, structure for the committees. Now, I talked about what they do. Our job as a census is to come and train them and give them all the support they need to be successful in their count. And so that's going on right now. If you'd like to look at maps and uh, data, we have uh, something called Rome, which is one of our applications. And in that application, we can pinpoint what we consider the hard to count areas based on past census data. And those areas would be those where we don't think the responses are coming in at a level that we think they should. Once the census gets underway, census day is April 1, uh, we will be going live and looking at all the data coming in to see where we need to dispatch more resources. But before that, on 
March, the third week in March, somewhere around there, every household will get a postcard. That postcard will have a barcode on the back, and that barcode is what you will use to reply to the census questionnaire. And again, you can do it any number of ways, even through the mail or over the phone if you like. And we'll have folks who uh, speak 12 languages if someone who's not proficient in English wants to get theirs done over the phone. So, Teresa talked about jobs. Folks, we gotta hire a lot of people. We've got to hire about 5,600 people in North Carolina. Again, in Wake County, we're paying $19 an hour, uh, minimum 20 hours, so it's flexible. If you already have a job and you're looking to make some extra money, uh, you need to apply. I'm going to be very honest and tell you it takes a while to get through the process because everyone has to go through a background check because they could be dealing with sensitive information. And so it slows the process down. So if you've applied or you know someone who has and they say, well, I haven't heard anything, just please ask them to be patient. And if you have an interest, I would say go ahead and get your stuff in now. That way you can get in the pool to be considered. And once you do apply, there's a button to press on there that says I would like to be considered for a supervisory position. Please click that button because that will open up more opportunities for you. Um, but the other thing I want to say is that, you know, people have said to me as I've spoken around the state, uh, we don't really like folks coming to our door. You know, we don't like strangers coming to the door. I see that young lady over there nodding. The best way to keep somebody from coming to your door is to return the questionnaire. If you return the questionnaire, uh, no one's coming to knock because if we don't hear from you in a certain period of time, we're going to send you something in the mail. If we don't hear from you again, we'll send you another one. The third time, we're going to send you the questionnaire. And if we still don't hear from you, then the folks are going to come knocking. Okay, so we don't want to come knocking because it's expensive to have folks going door to door. We want to use the technology or you can send it, send the form back in the mail if you choose to do that. Um, and so please let your friends and family know if they don't to complete all of the questionnaire, there's a chance they could get a knock at the door. Doesn't mean they will, but we would like for all the questions to be answered. Um, so I thank you. I would like to ask the commission to consider a resolution in support of the 2020 census. Uh, we hope that you will do that. Many of the communities in the state have already done that, so we'd like you to join them as well. Um, and uh, so I would be glad to take any questions if I have time, ladies and gentlemen. Do we have a copy of a resolution in this pack? We're gonna bring it to you in March. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, how long does the census take? Well, the census, we have to deliver the results to the president on uh, December the 31st at the end of the year. And so there'll be a concerted effort after census day as we continue to watch the uh, questionnaires that are coming back in. Like, as I mentioned, we'll put re more resources where we need to. Uh, there will also be some mobile units that will be going around to help people fill out the census as well. And of course, like I mentioned, Wake County has a huge effort. You'll hear more about their effort. And our TV advertising is just starting, so you'll begin to see those ads as well. Okay, questions from the board? No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission. I appreciate the opportunity again. Thank you, Joe and Lisa, I appreciate it. Okay, planning, SUP 2019-11-715 Shepherd School Road. Michael? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the board. Uh, tonight is the uh, possible decision regarding a special use permit for 715 Shepherd School Road. As you will recall, there was a quasi judicial hearing held at the uh, regular January meeting uh, regarding this item. And as uh, once again, as a point of clarification, um, this is operating under the um, code of ordinances that were modified back in October where the Board of Commissioners um, renders a decision without the Planning Board making a recommendation. Um, all the other parameters um, of the uh, zoning code would still be applicable, whereas any new applications coming forward will have to meet the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, as a reminder, uh, the applicant is requesting to use the existing structure as a rooming house. They received um, a previous uh, special use permit to operate 
as a family or adult care facility. Um, however, due to the occupancy details, um, they are unable to meet one of the requirements um, to operate under that classification specifically to obtain the state licensure. So by default, the use and activity would fall under rooming house, which is um, still classified as a special use permit. Um, it was previously located with the R10 residential zoning district. Currently, the zoning district is um, downtown peripheral. The applicant specifically notes that it'll have seven rooming units, a kitchen, a living area, and eight parking spaces. Um, this is the full background history. Uh, originally, as I noted, in August 2011, um, the special use permit was issued. It did have a particular condition of ex um, where it was going to be expire after so many years. Um, we were notified of it uh, operating without approvals in September and a notice of violation was issued and then the applicant submitted for special use approval in November. This is the location of the subject property. Zebulon Middle School is located right here. Um, as I previously noted, the current zoning is downtown periphery. Previous, um, specifically when the application came in, it was zoned R10, um, and it was still classified as a special use permit within the R10 zoning district. Uh, this is the site plan that the applicant submitted um, to address uh, condition number six. Um, and all the applicable requirements for public hearing notification have been met um, and uh, the quasi-judicial meeting was held at the first or the regular um, board meeting in January. This is the subject property. Um, this is the dwelling unit that, I, that the um, rooming house is located in. Um, it is a traditional single family residential style structure. Um, there was some confusion and we did clarify this is the site. And these are the adjacent structures, as well as across the street. And this is um, an apartment complex behind these structures over here. Um, with this, six findings of fact need to be met in order for the board to approve the request. Um, staff uh, has uh, gone through and conducted a review of the standards that we can make a recommendation on, uh, finding specifically that it does meet uh, number two, five, and six. Uh, the remaining um, uh, findings need to be presented um, by the applicant, which he provided testimony at the January meeting. Um, ultimately, the Board of Commissioners is responsible for uh, making the determination if all six findings of fact have been met. Um, in the event, uh, that the board does find that all six findings of fact have been met. Um, the sample motion on your screen is available for you. And I'm available if you have any questions. Um, however, no additional testimony can be provided um, being that the quasi-judicial hearing has been closed. You said that all six need to be met. That's correct. But that <clears throat> the applicant met I can find it here, three or four of them. What, what's the story there? Uh, s staff believes that they've, they're in compliance with number two, five, and six. Um, namely two, uh, the standards of the ordinance, um, specifically chapter four of the, uh, of the zoning code um, have been met, um, that it's a meeting five in general conformity with the town's adopted policies, um, comparable uses within close proximity, as well as uh, number six, uh, the sample um, conceptual plan that was provided as part of the application um, addresses that. So are you saying they did not meet the other? Staff cannot make recommendation on those. That's for the, the board to render a decision okay. if it's met. All right, I wanna be clear. This is the first one we've handled this mm -hmm. way, so the learning curve. Okay, board. Anybody? I move that we approve the application on ACP 2019-11 to approve a rooming house at 715 Shepherd School Road as submitted. Findings that uh, all the findings of the fact are required per section 152.038 of the Code of Ordinance 
have been met. I'll second that. Motion's been made and second. Other comments or discussion? Mayor Matheny, may I ask a question of uh, Mr. Clark? Mike, you mentioned in your uh, staff report that the there were conditions of approval related to the construction drawing site plan approval, mm -hmm. and the applicant has agreed to those conditions. Would it be appropriate uh, for Commissioner York to add including the conditions uh, to his motion? Yes, it would. It was uh, mentioned during the testimony, um, and they're minor enough in nature that staff can work with the applicant to bring that into compliance. So, Commissioner York, would you be willing to add that to your motion? Yes. And is that okay with the second? Okay. I was going to say the two conditions are noted in the back of the package here. We may want to reference those in the motion. Is that the one that he spoke of? I'm not looking at that. Are they, yeah, the it first is. one, okay. this, these are staff recommendations to us that if we approve this, number one, the property must be brought into current code compliance, meaning the plans will go through the Town of Zebulon Technical Review Committee process if the special use permit is approved. And number two, at no time may a vehicle be parked on an unimproved portion of the front yard. Okay, but that was part of this. That we just yes. Okay, all right. Okay, other, other comments or discussion? Not, all in favor? And the motion carries. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Relay for life. Good evening, Mayor, uh, members of the board. Um, tonight, coming in front of you to ask for a modification of the Relay for, Life, uh, Relay for Life application for the facility use agreement. You may recall in May of 2019, the board and Relay for Life agreed to allow this facility to be used for three years. Since then, the executive board of the Relay for Life committee has been working to modernize and, and revitalize the Relay for Life events. And tonight, we got Vicki Curtis coming here to give you a little update on what their plans are and get your blessing to move forward with this project. Um, before Vicki comes up, I will tell you, she's been with Relay for Life for almost over 20 years. So uh, she's, she's, she's clearly a, a tr tr true believer in this, in this Relay for Life, and she's a, you know, a, a caregiver herself. Uh, we're pleased as Public Works Department to be partnering with them since 2007. Okay, Vicki. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I'd like to begin with a presentation. Mr. Mayor, would you join me? Sure. Join. As Chris mentioned, we've been working together for 10 years in this process, and we would like to recognize the town of Zebulon. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. We'd like to recognize the town of Zebulon as a presenting sponsor, and thank you for helping us make a difference in 2019, and obviously the years prior, but definitely right. in 2019. Okay. okay. Thank well, you thank very you. much. Thank you so much, and it's been our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And there's the little base for the plaque. Oh. Okay. All right, and if you will um, indulge me one more minute to recognize another group. Uh, we're so thankful for the town, but there's a specific part of the town that has worked so closely with us that we feel that they need uh, special recognition. So we would like to recognize uh, this year uh, the Town of Zebulon, Chris Ray, and the Public Works Department, the dedication, support, and outstanding service you provide is so appreciated. Thank you for helping us make a difference. I won't take but just a few moments of your time. Um, we've already been in front of each other uh, earlier with the approval of our use of your facility, and we appreciate that so very much. Relay across the nation, not just in Wake County, but or North Carolina, but across the nation is seeing 
a bit of a decline in terms of support from teams and team members as well as the community and their presence at those particular events. And I think everybody across the nation is struggling to try to figure out what's the magic, what's the next twist that we need to put on this event. This event was started to be an all-night event where you walked all night. Someone was on the track constantly from your team and you kind of tag teamed and, and traded places um, and you raised money for, for the fight against cancer. And that has morphed into a variety of events trying to maintain the fight to find the cure to end the disease. We have struggled for the last several years. Uh, we moved from the Mudcats to the, the grounds here in front of the building um, because our numbers had decreased and you were kind enough as to allow us that move. We're still struggling. The mayor and I have met for the last two or three years here trying to, at, at the event, kind of sit down and we kind of scratch our heads. What do we do? What can we do to bring the people back? And our team, in all honesty, in East Wake, sat around the table several months ago and debated, what do we do? Do we bow out gracefully and stop? Or do we keep fighting? Do we keep pushing? And our response to each other was, somebody who's fighting the battle can't stop. They can't walk away. So we don't need to walk away. So how do we try to make it different? So we've come up with a new idea. Will it work? I don't know, but we're willing to try. And what we're going to do is to create a benefit concert, a battle of the bands. We're going to have several bands to come and perform. And while they perform, we know that each band has their own following and they will raise money by donations, and whoever raises the most money prior to the event and during the event will be the winner of the night, okay? We're also going to bring in food trucks. This is drastically different for our teams because they're used to providing uh, the food themselves and creating the, the food concept around the track. So we're going to bring in food trucks to provide the the main food items. Our teams will still provide the desserts and the drinks, coffee, tea, Cokes, that type of thing. We will still do our traditional relay stuff. We will have our caregiver walk, our survivor walk, our kids walk. We're going to do all of that intermingled with the battle of the bands. One other thing that has been brought up many times that our um, meeting has been, how do we reach the younger crowd? What can we do to pull them in? Well, we think the food trucks is one. They have their own following. People follow those trucks wherever they go. So we'll have the food truck following, we'll have the band following, and we looked at what else brings the people in. And one of the things that kept coming to the table was a potential beer and wine garden that is self that is going to be contained, working with the police department uh, to monitor intake, that type of thing. And we're struggling with whether we want to do that or not, but we want to put it on the table as something that's a possibility if you're willing to work with us on that. Um, we believe that it in looking at other events, this is something that has been a big draw. And in order to get the people, you've got to find what the pull is. You've got to find what will bring them in and what's the hook. So that's sort of our concept of where we'd like to move for, the, for this year. Will it work? Like I said, we don't know, but we're willing to give it a try. I will say, after hearing the census presentation, if you want to come set up at the relay, you're welcome, okay? Um, and we'll see how many people we've got that show up. I provided you with a program from this past year. If you have never been to relay, shame on you. 
And I say that in tongue in cheek, but in all honesty, if you haven't, I welcome you to come. It's an event that is very meaningful. It's fun. It's happy. It's it has its sad moments, and it's it can also be humbling. But it is something that is presented here in your community. We represent the total Eastern Wake, but it's our event is is housed here on your front lawn. We represent Nightdale, Wendell, and Zebulon, and you have been kind enough to open your door for us, and we thank you for that. Any questions for me? What additional funds are gonna be associated with the addition of the Battle of the Bands and the alcohol sales? Um, we pretty much operate on a zero budget. Uh, <laughs> Well, do you have, do I you tend have a cost to, I tend estimate? To, I tend to be one of these folks that I come and knock on somebody's door and say, are you willing to donate your time and your money? And we have not had to pay for anything to this point for our event. For I mean, everything's donated. Um, the only thing that we're looking at, a potential cost, is because we're having multiple bands in order, instead of having each band tear down all their sound equipment and then reset, then the next band set it back up, it makes sense to have a, a sound person, which we used to do when we were at the Mudcat Stadium. That person used to donate it free. Um, they are now deceased. They lost their battle to cancer. And the people that I'm working with have given me a figure, but I'm still knocking on the door to see if they'll accommodate us with some donation there. So I don't have an exact figure for the cost of setting up the stage and the sound at this point. Um, my guess is it will be less than $1,500 if I had to put a tag on it right this minute. Okay, but thank you. otherwise, that's the only cost that I'm aware of to us. Other questions? So what you're asking us to do is to modify the application to allow the Battle of the Bands and uh, an event with beer and wine sales? Well, we've always had a band. We've always had bands. So I think it's just the modification of the beer and wine. Well, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm reading from this. That's okay. But, but yeah, adding of the beer and wine. I recall one time you asked me early on what would get more people here, and I said beer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I remember that conversation. <laughs> But anyway, um, what's the pleasure of the board? I don't have any trouble with it, with the modification. I make a motion that we modify the Relate to Life facility as use as requested. As requested. Okay. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Other comments or discussion? Okay, all in favor? Motion carries. Vicki? Thank you for your time. Yes, Thank you for, mostly for your support, and I hope to see each of you at Relay. All right. Ordinance 202040, Sunday, Surly, <laughs> Surly, Sunday, Early Alcohol Sales. Good evening, Mayor, members of the board. Senate Bill 155 was signed into law in June, on June 30th of 2017. This legislation allowed the sale of alcoholic beverages before noon on Sundays, subject to local government approval. There was a request by a local business owner for the town to allow for the early alcohol sales, and this request was discussed at the board's December work session. And at that work session, there was support to consider an ordinance at a future regular meeting. Discussion before the board tonight is whether they are interested in adopting the attached ordinance to allow the sale of alcoholic beverages at 10 a.m. on Sundays. And we stand available for any questions the board may have. Questions? What's your pleasure? Make a motion we adopt ordinance 2020-40 as submitted. Okay. Second. A second. Motion made and second. Other comments or discussion? All in favor? Okay, and the motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you, Joe. All right, board comments. Uh, Larry, I'll start down on your end tonight. Uh, I guess from the news, the one thing I w think we need to stay aware of is the um, um, virus, the coronavirus, and what may happen, and just keep it on our radar screen. Yeah. Okay, and? Oh, yeah.
Um, yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge our first responders in a couple of situations that we had the other week. Um, one with the uh, barricaded uh, situation. And I know a lot of times in the news, we always see where there's some loss of life or injury. And uh, that was not the case. And uh, I think our staff should be commended for that because it takes training to be involved in those kind of situations where they turn out to be uh, no loss of life and no injury. So thank you. Yeah. I got nothing. Okay. Joe, manager's report. Sure. Just uh, for announcements for the public. So uh, Monday of next week, we will have a joint public hearing here in this room at uh, 7 o'clock. And now that you've passed the uh, Unified Development Ordinance, this will be your first of your quarterly uh, amendments or updates to that ordinance. Uh, we'll have something that's being brought forward by a business owner, which is just speaks to how the UDO process is supposed to work. It's supposed to work with the business community. Uh, we'll have a chronic violations ordinance come before you. We're getting more active in uh, um, making property owners more mindful to take care of their properties, and this will speed up that process. And then, as we've mentioned in the past, incorporating board of adjustment responsibilities into the planning board. And then later in the month, uh, you have your annual retreat. That's thir uh, Thursday and Friday, February 20th and 21st. That's going to be at Rocky Mount Mills. Uh, it's a good example of a redevelopment of a, an abandoned site, as well as there's some redevelopment examples to look at in downtown Rocky Mount. Some of the topics that we'll talk about is use of fund balance, which is the town savings account, and uh, how to use that and how much of that to use for some pending projects coming our way. The board will also discuss uh, water rates, events, event planning, uh, farm fresh market. And another thing that I thought was an uh, interesting uh, tidbit and speaks to some of the things that we'll do uh, at retreat, we'll have some board building exercises, not only for the board of commissioners, but for the management team as well. Um, with the last election, we went from 20.7 years of experience on average down to 10.3, and there's nothing uh, necessarily notable about that other than the fact that the last board had uh, spent a minimum time of working 12 years together, whereas two-thirds of this board um, is just starting to work together. Uh, similarly, on our management team, we have uh, two brand new department directors, and so um, we're going to work hard to get to know each other so we can understand where each other are, are coming from, but also we can be uh, put you all in a position to be an effective board so you can push forward goals. So uh, we'll do that through um, the risk compass exercise. And I just remind everyone if they haven't taken that to go ahead and take that. That includes uh, staff. And then uh, you will also revisit your strategic plan. You ad adopted a strategic plan a couple years ago. You put in there some tasks. You are a new board. I'm sure you have some new ideas. And so this will be an opportunity to put some things on the, on the table um, for us to start working on. So once again, that's Thursday and Friday, February 20th and 21st at Rocky Mountain Mills. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Okay, thank you folks. I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. We're done.